Next point, uh, we probably gonna take some time, you know, last week we didn't have a lecture and the week before we cut it short. So if we go over time a little bit, uh, I hope that's all right with everyone. Okay, Jazakumullah khair. Next point, da'wa, next point is, da'wa must be in the best of all manners. Wisdom must be in da'wa. And it must be based on forgiveness. It must be based on being kind. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. The radix of da'wah is to be kind, to be gentle, to choose the best words, to choose the best methods, to choose the best manners. Listen to that because the next point after this is important. Again, listen to this because then point after this is not going to erase this point. The foundation or origin for da'wah is to be kind. You must be gentle in how you convey it. You must choose the best words. You go to the thesaurus. If there's seven words to convey a message, you choose the best and most kind word to convey your message. You be in the best of your manners and you be and you choose the best of all methods. Allah said, husna Surah Al-Baqarah. Speak to people, good, the best, husna. The best of all ways. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ In Surah Ali Umran, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضْضًا فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضْضًا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضْضُ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ By the mercy of Allah, had you, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It's by the mercy of Allah that you dealt with them gently. Had you been severe and harsh with them, they would have had dispersed. They would have dispersed away. They, had, they would have broken away from you, Prophet of Allah. And they would have went on on their own. They would have left you and they would have went on their own. فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ So ask Allah forgiveness for them. And this goes back to, remember the first statement of the author, اِعْلَمْ رَحِمَكُ اللَّهِ Ask Allah for forgiveness for them. Why? These are like students. You're like a father to them. And consult them in the affairs. Even if you're not going to choose and take their decision, consult them to show them how kind you are to them. وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ In Surah Al-Ankabut, Allah says, do not argue. If matter reach to a debate, if matter reach to an argument, do not debate with the people of the scripture, the Jews and the Christian, Unless it be in a manner, in a fashion that is better. Unless it is in the best of all manners. With good words, good words, illa billati ahsan, and good manners. This is when it gets to a debate. So imagine when it is in a da'wah. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mu'idhat al hasana in Surah Al-Nahl. Allah says to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa invite, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa invite to the way of your Lord, invite to Islam, invite to the Sharia by wisdom. Id'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah, by wisdom, divine revelation. Id'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal maw'idhati al hasana. Fair preaching and argue with them in the way that is better, the best. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he's the Prophet of Allah, he was ordered to choose and convey the message in the best of all manners. And Allah tells them, if you would have been harsh, they would have dispersed. If that, they would have dispersed away from you. If that's to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then what should we say? Wisdom in da'wah is not to compromise the teaching of Islam. Wisdom in da'wah doesn't mean you bargain on principles of Islam. The modernist version of wisdom in da'wah is to compromise the principles of Islam and to give in. That's their version. That's the modernist version. The sellout, deluded people, yes, that's their version. To give in and tell, you know, tell them what that which they, 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 they want to hear. That's their version of wisdom. Ibn al-Qayyim in Madarij al-Salikin actually defines wisdom. 
the way that is supposed to be done in, and in a manner that is supposed to be done in, and a time in that is supposed to be done in. There's a difference in speaking to people on a level they understand that we mentioned in a previous point, and here this point is to be speaking to people in kind manner. The previous point is to speak people on a level they understand, and here it is to speak to people in a kind and wise manner. That's one side, okay, that's one side. On the other side, that's one thing, in compromising Islam, which is totally different. You have to understand those are two different things. Just because you want to speak to people on a level they understand and you be kind to them, it doesn't mean you compromise Islam. That are totally, two totally different things. In Hadith Anas, in Sahih Bukhari, and in, in Sahih Muslim, the Hadith narrated on the authority of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an. He said, the Anas ibn Malik said, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Mu'adh, and it's actually that uh, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told it to Anas, and that he told it to Mu'adh, and he told it to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. And uh, it's also in addition to Bukhari and Muslim, it's also in Musnad Ahmad, uh, Musnad al-Bazzar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, make things easy for people and do not make it difficult for them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he sent Mu'adh in Sahih al-Bukhari, in Muslim, in uh, Musnad uh, al-Bazzar, uh, and, and it's also narrated by Anas, he said, make things easy for people and don't make things difficult for them. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. Bashiru wa la tunaffiru. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. Bashiru wa la tunaffiru. It means make salah easy. Yeah, make salah easy. Does that tell them, oh, you, you know, if you don't make salah, that's good. Uh, make salah anytime you want. If you come back uh, lazy from work, do it all, combine all five of them after Isha because you've been at work. That's not what it means. The hadith says make things easy for them. Make salah easy for them. Yes. How do you make salah easy? Teach them that when they're traveling, that they can combine and show in their prayers. That's making it easier for them. You make it easy by showing them some of the rukhas in Islam. Make it easy for them by telling people that if you're sick, you don't have to fast. If you're sick, you don't have to make your salah standing. You can make your salah sitting. If you can't do it sitting, you can make it laying down. If you can't make it laying down, make it with your eyes. Make things easier by showing them how they don't have to fast when they are sick. Uh, when, uh, make it easier for them by showing them that they don't have to fast when they're traveling. That's making it easier for them. Make it, make it easy for them by showing them that hastening the fast in Ramadan or in any regular fast and delaying the suhoor, hastening the fast and delaying the suhoor is the best and that's recommended by the Prophet ﷺ. Why? So the gap between the time that you're fasting will be shown. That's making it easier for them. That's how you make it easier for them. Unlike what they take it to mean today. Teach them that the Prophet ﷺ was never given a choice between two halal, two halal matters, except he chose the one that's easier. You teach them that. So when they're presented with a choice in Islam, they don't make things difficult on themselves. That's a choice between halal matters. Between halal matters. It's taken today by some of the deluded sellout modernists to mean haram. If it's a haram and a halal and the haram is easier, you go with the haram. Meaning, it could be, for example, going to Hajj, driving or walking. I have the choice. Most likely, the Prophet ﷺ would have chose riding because it's easier. That's halal and that's halal. So, the Prophet ﷺ most likely, and he did go riding to Mecca. It doesn't mean that if one is given a choice between a halal and haram, because the hadith, in the beginning of the hadith, it mentions it broadly. It says, مَا خُيِّرْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى بين أمرين Between two matters. So it doesn't specify, but it really means halal matters because the end of the hadith we're going to get to. It does not mean if one is given a choice between a halal and a haram, that the haram is easier, that they choose the haram. That's not what the hadith means. Because the continuation of the hadith says at the end of it, and if it was a sinful matter, he would be the furthest away from it. 
That's the end of the hadith, that many don't mention. And if it was a sinful matter, he would be the furthest away from it. Making it easy doesn't mean changing a haram to a halal to make it easy, like the fatawa we see today uh, under the interpretations of, uh, of uh, uh, making things easy based on this hadith. Oh, what's your proof? Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. Oh, usury is halal. Why in the West? Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. The people, if they sell alcohol to non muslim that's halal. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. Uh, they went to an extreme and an extent in these kind of issues under the misunderstanding of yassiru wa la tu'assiru. You see what it means? You make your salah, sit in if you can't do it standing. You combine if you're traveling. You don't have to fast when, uh, when you're traveling or when you're ill. Uh, or telling a woman today, some of them uh, tell a woman, oh, you can wear those caps. Today there's caps, caps, and they call them hijab. A little hat they put on, and, and that, that's called hijab today. Why? She's in America, she might have to ride the bus or she have to go. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. We're after, you know, the Muslims in the West, they can do that because they're, the, the eyes on them. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. Someone even further to say no hijab, go ahead, no hijab at all. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. So basically, basically the point of this point that we're talking about, the radix or foundation of da'wah is to be kind. And to make things easier, the proper channels, in the proper lines, there's a proper line. Just like when you're driving, you don't go past this line or that line. There's, there's two lines set forth, you make things easier between those lines. You make things easy and you lower your wing while you're conveying the message. That's what meaning, ادعو إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة. When the Prophet ﷺ passed a woman at a grave, she was crying, she was weeping. And the Prophet ﷺ, as usual, tries to calm people down, tries to relate to them. So he told her, Isbiri wahtasibi, be patient and seek reward from Allah. She said, Ilayka anni, fa innaka lam tusab bi musibati. Get away from me. She told the Prophet, ﷺ, get away from me. She's like scolding the Prophet. ﷺ. You haven't been hit with a calamity. I've been hit. This is the Prophet, ﷺ, she's speaking to Adaya. Another da'iyah would go off on her. How dare you speak to me like, you know who I am? I'm Sheikh Sheikh so and so. You know how many lectures I've given? You know how many books I've read? The Prophet ﷺ just walked away normally. When the Sahaba told her that was the Prophet ﷺ, she found out that was the Prophet ﷺ, she went quickly to him. And he was lenient. He gives her more words. She comes to apologize and he gives her more words of advice. He says, إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ الصَّدْمَةِ الْأُولَى Patience is, he gives her more advice. If you have in the future a problem, patience is when calamity first afflicts you. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't go and go off at her because he understood her situation. She's in a situation where she lost the son. So he understood that. But keep that in mind when we talk about the next point. In Musnad Ahmad and the third of Abu Umama, a man comes to the Prophet ﷺ asking him to commit fornication. He says, oh, Prophet of Allah, commit fornication. If that was to happen today with the ulama today, Allah alam what would happen to that man. They're going to declare him a fasiq, and they're going to talk about him, and they're going to say, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam calmed the sahaba down because they got mad. How dare you disrespect the Prophet sallallahu and us, for example, with a question like that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, mah, 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 meaning take it easy. Calm down, all of you. They went to silence. They're obedient to the Prophet. They went to complete silence. Then he told the man, come here. The man was at the end of the halaqa because he's there to ask a question and keep going on his way. Come here. Get closer. I want you to get closer. You know how, how that feels when you bring someone, a young youth, to you? The Prophet brings him to his side. And he gets close to the Prophet Muhammad Then he speaks to that youth in a way with both proof and intellect. He didn't start slamming him with ayat and hadith. No, he also used intellect because this was a youth, a young man who uses his mind. A lot of the youth, that's why it's the best dealing with the youth because they analyze things and they can tell. They won't follow, especially the youth, they won't follow the trend of the elders. He said to him, you accept it for your mother? The young boy said, no. He said, then people don't accept that for their mothers. 
People don't want that for their mothers. Do you accept that for your sister? Would you want that to happen to your sister? He said, no. Who would want that to happen to a sister? He said, people don't accept that or want it for their sisters. Then he said, do you accept it for your paternal aunt? He said, no. Who would accept that for their aunt? He said, then people don't accept that for their aunt. Then he said, do you accept that for your maternal aunt? He named them one by so the person can, he could have used one example, but so the man, the youth can think, would you accept it for your maternal aunt? He said, no, who would accept that for his maternal aunt? He said, people will not accept that for their aunts as well. Then he wipes on his chest, he grabs him, he puts his hand on his chest, and he said to him, make dua to him, he said, Allahumma ghfir dhamba. Allahumma ghfir dhamba. Wa tahir qalba wa hassan farja. Oh Allah, forgive his sin and purify his heart and purify his private parts from doing any haram. The young boy left saying, Wallahi, I left from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and there's nothing I despised more than zina. And he never went near it. He didn't go near it, nor did he have the desire for it after that. Few words. That's the wisdom. Keep that in mind also when we talk about the next point as well. In Bukhari and in Muslim, Hadith Anas, the Bedouin who comes into the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Masjid. Out of all the desert, he's coming from the desert. And out of all the outside area around the masjid. Medina was, when I went there as a kid, was very small. You could walk all Medina in a few, maybe in, in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, the, the, the core part of Medina. back when. So imagine how it was during the Prophet's time. Out of the desert, of course now it's big, but back then it was small. Out in the desert, he couldn't find no better spot. He couldn't find no spot to urinate. He goes to the corner of the masjid and urinates. If this were to happen today in a masjid, what would happen? The shoes would be flying at him, he'd get a beat in, and, and, and then they're going to call the police and tell him, take him out of here and put him in prison where uh, he probably changed his religion or something even worse than that. The Prophet ﷺ tells the Sahaba who got mad and went up to him, Da'u! Da'u! Don't cut, the urine, don't cut him from urinating. Ibn Hajar, when he commented on this hadith, he said, Look how deep the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ is in da'wah. If he was to let them stop them, stop him from urinating, it's going to be all over himself. Because he's going to stop, what he's going to do is get up. Because there's a, he's not going to be able to stop, it's going to be all over, Ibn Hajar says, it's going to be all over his clothes and all over the masjid. The next point is, if, 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 if he's going to... Uh, if he holds it in, and if he was to able to hold it in when they stop him, then it's going to cause him harm. It's going to harm him. So after he was done, the Prophet ﷺ told the angered Sahaba how to clean it. Established a lesson for us how to clean. If you have it in your carpet, what you do? Then he brought the Bedouin. He didn't let it go. He didn't let things slide. No, but he dealt with the matter with wisdom. He brought the Bedouin and he told him in such kind, in wise manners that could all, the Prophet ﷺ only could do. He, the, 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 the man, the Bedouin left saying, Oh Allah, have mercy on me and on the Prophet ﷺ. Me and, me and the Prophet ﷺ alone meaning. Even that, the Prophet ﷺ didn't let him go. He said, you have, uh, the mercy of Allah is vast and you can't li limit it to me and you. So the Prophet corrected, but he used the wise way where people can accept it and where people can relate to it. In hikmah, in mawadha, in hasana. In Bukhari, in Muslim. In Bukhari actually, how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi, I don't think it's in Muslim. From what I call right now, I don't think it's in Muslim. In Bukhari, how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi uh, corrected Umar ibn Salama, Umar ibn Abi Salama, how to eat from a plate. In such kind words. And he accepted it and continued like that to the latter part of his life. Uh, a broader lesson was uh, when the Prophet ﷺ was on the Kaaba, on the gate of the Kaaba. And the people who for nearly two decades did everything to harm him. Everything you can imagine to harm him. Now he has 10,000 well-armed men surrounding them. They're at his mercy. He could direct them with a finger, with one word, and they would all be eliminated off the face of the earth. 
These are people who harmed him for decades. And they harmed his family and killed some of the companions. He surrounds them with 10,000 men. And he says to them after he gives a sermon, what do you think I'm going to do with you today? What do they say? The magnanimous, the son of the magnanimous. You're not going to do nothing. He said, basically, when they met the magnanimous, the son of magnanimous, you're going to forgive us. You're really not going to do nothing. Because when one is generous, when one has noble character, and he's at a power, status of power, he's going to forgive. He said, that, he said the words of Yusuf alayhisalam. Let there be no reproach cast upon you. May Allah forgive you. You're free to go. So you see how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt in wisdom in these matters. Muawiyah uh, ibn al-Hakam. Many examples. Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam al-Salmi, Sahih Muslim. He was making salah behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A man sneezed. So Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam said, Yarhamuk Allah, to the man who sneezed. While they're in salah, he said, Yarhamuk Allah. From the hadith, the way the hadith goes, it appears that Muawiyah was upset that the man didn't say, Yahdikum Allah wa sahba alakum. He didn't respond to him. So it seems as that Muawiyah kept saying, radiallahu an, Muawiyah kept saying, uh, and this is different than Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, but radiallahu an, both of them. Uh, he said, he kept saying, Arhamuk Allah. It annoyed the Sahaba to the point some of them, the hadith says, some of them clapped on their laps. They clapped on their laps to tell the man, be quiet. He understood it. He got upset and he quieted. Why he repeated it? He assumed, he possibly wanted the man to say, Yahdikum Allah wa When he seen the Sahaba get annoyed and they clapped on their laps, he went silent. Now the salah is done. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brings this man. The Prophet called him over. There's a mistake. He didn't let it slide and say wisdom is to let it slide. No. He calls Muawiyah. Come over here. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised him and directed him and taught him and told him this salah, we don't say this kind of thing in it. The salah is for this, this and that. He said, Muawiyah said, Wallahi he didn't hate me. Wallahi, he did not hit me, nor did he curse me. He gently, in the most kind way, told me that this is salah, and we can't say any of that which you said in it. You only do tasbih and takbir and recite Quran in it. So the Prophet ﷺ explained it in a kind manner. Look what happened from that story. As soon as he did that, that was the end of that part. You know what happened? Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam opens his heart now, begins to have a heart, right, right in that setting, right in that same setting, begins to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the Prophet Wasallam and asks him questions about, uh, uh, pertaining to other matters uh, that uh, he was on before he became Muslim. Uh, the Prophet Wasallam advised him, that opened his heart, he began to ask many questions about matters pertaining to how his life was in Jahiliyyah. And the Prophet ﷺ told him that that is misguidance. The point of that is, when the Prophet related to him in a wise and a kind manner, it showed that man Muawiyah radiallahu an, that the Prophet was approachable. You can ask him anything. You can go to him with anything. After that, you know who this man was? This man was the man who brought the servant. He had slapped on her face and he was asking the Prophet ﷺ that he felt bad for hitting her and what the Prophet ﷺ deems as his judgment. Had the Prophet been harsh, he wouldn't have not had that heart-to-heart -heart talk after that, he corrected that issue. This man would have not ever came to him later on in life with a slave telling him, I hate this, what should I do? He would have been afraid to approach the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet asked that woman, and that's the famous hadith that you know, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked her, where is Allah? She didn't speak the language, but she understood. She pointed to the sky, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam free her. Had the Prophet not been kind and correct in Muawiyah the first time, had he said, be quiet, you don't do this in the Salah, 
and embarrassed him in front of the Sahaba or told him don't come to the congregation or he could have said one word you know, that would have been harsh where the man would have never came back again. But he felt so comfortable that he can come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with anything. And that's how we learn one of the benefits of it. We learn one of, one of the biggest proof in the Sunnah and Allah, in Allah, if, uh, uh, is this hadith right here. Allah told two messengers pertaining to da'wah. Allah told two messengers, Musa and his brother, فَقُولَ لَهُ Both of you, Musa and Harun. فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرُ يَخْشَى What more do you want for proof and wisdom? This, is, this, this hits the peak. Wisdom in da'wah and being kind in da'wah. You, you, this hits the peak. Allah tells two of us, the special messengers, Musa and Harun, speak to him kindly. Perhaps he may accept the admonition that you're going to give him and maybe he'll fear Allah and come back to the right path. Ibn Kathir commenting on this verse said, this is a lesson. Fir'aun was in the peak of his arrogance. Fir'aun was in the peak of his pride. Yet one, yet, yet one of the most chosen messengers, Musa and his brother Harun, is ordered to approach a man who is in the peak of his arrogance and pride with a kind way. If Allah said to speak to him gently, to Fir'aun, a tyrant who said, I am the Supreme Lord. Allah tells Musa and Harun, speak gently to a man who says, I am your Supreme Lord. He said, Ana rabbukum al -ala. Then imagine how much mercy and compassion and kindness you need to have when you speak to someone who says, Allah is the most Supreme Lord. Fir'aun said, I am your Supreme Lord. And they were ordered to speak to him kindly. You were ordered, you, you, are speaking to people who say, Allah is my Supreme Lord. So imagine how much kindness and sympathy and mercy and wisdom you need to have with them. A man walked in on al Ma'moon during the days of the Abbas Khilafah when he was a Khalifa. And he began to, uh, to, to admonish him very harshly. So al Ma'moon was wise. When he spoke, he was pretty much wise. He said, Allah sent someone better than you. Allah sent someone better than you to a man who is not worse than who, who is worse than me. Allah sent a man better than you to a man who is worse than me. And he told Musa and Harun, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لينا. Speak to him kindly. Ibn Mas'ud in Al Bukhari said, It's as if I'm looking at the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he's saying the story of a prior messenger whose people beat him, and he was saying, Allahumma ghfir li qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. A messenger who was bleeding, the Prophet used to convey the message, and he used to wipe the blood off and say, Oh Allah, forgive my people, they don't know. This is da'wah to Allah. Kindness, you gotta, uh, you gotta take uh, uh, the, the hardship that go with it. Sometimes you may be humiliated, you gotta take that. That's all part of da'wah. The, da the point of this whole point is, be kind, wise in how you convey the da'wah. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the fountain and well of tenderness and warm heartedness. That's our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was a shoreless ocean of kindness and love. That was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's not a harsh word that someone can say, why did he say that? That wasn't wise or correct in the matter or the setting that he said it in. That's our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He sallallahu alayhi wasallam was mercy, a spring of mercy. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ and He was compassion. He was compassion. And he was a mercy to mankind. Not mankind, to the universe. Alameen is the universe. Human, jinn, and the universe itself. Believers and non-believers alike. He didn't give in. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam didn't give in. When there was a mistake, he corrected it. He never let a mistake pass by. Never, never did the Lord, Prophet ﷺ let a mistake pass by. He did not just let it go, but he did correct it, and he did it in the most kind and appropriate and wise manner. A woman from Bani Israel, a believer woman from Bani Israel, a prostitute, went to heaven, and Allah forgave her of her sins, of prostitution, and Allah knows what else of her sins, Allah forgave her because she had a compassion towards a dog. Mercy. Your da'wah is mercy. 
When you're a da'ya, you have mercy. She had mercy to a dog because she brought him. She filled her shoes up and brought him water because she was thirsty and she knew how it felt and she knew the dog felt. She had mercy to the dog. So Allah forgave her for that. If mercy over a dog by a prostitute was means for her forgiveness from major sins, then imagine the reward for mercy over believers in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Imagine the reward for mercy over mankind. Da'wah is an art. It's dealing with the hearts. Da'wah is an art and it deals with the hearts. You're operating on the hearts. You have to know how to deal with it. Sometimes you're dealing with those who are righteous. It happens that you are dealing with those who are righteous. Sometimes you convey a matter in an improper way and it's a righteous matter, but you choose an improper way, it would lead a layman to see the truth that you're conveying as evil because of your approach. Pay attention to that. Sometimes you convey a matter in a way that's improper, that would, you're truth, you're on the truth, you're on the haq, but the way you convey it could lead a layman to see the truth as evil because of your approach. Sometimes, Sometimes an innovator or a modernist who are masters, especially the modernists, they're masters at their Botox uh, say cheese smiles. They have these Botox say cheese smiles when they convey their filth in their sellout form, diluted form of Islam. Uh, they have these fake smiles and they convey the matter with, and you could see it's so fake. Uh, uh, they convey that evil and because of the way they convey it, to laymen, they see that evil as truth. As a da'ya, you need to understand we're not dealing with devils. We are not here dealing with devils. Devils, uh, we're not ordered to give them da'wah. We're not dealing with angels either. Meaning, there are going to be mistakes. We're not dealing with stones. We're not dealing with stones here. We're dealing with souls. Some are good and some are bad. Some are good. Some are bad. There are uh, the dissolute fajr, the fajr, category of fajrin, and there, the, there are the devout muttaqin. You know the categories you're dealing with. And uh, Allah said in the Quran, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Nafs, the soul, and he, Allah gives an oath when, by the nafs. The soul and he who perfected it in proportion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he showed him that which is wrong and that which is right. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَهَا Meaning you're going to have both categories. So you have to convey the message in wisdom, in kindness. Some who are muttaqeen, some who are fujjar. You deal, you deal with that soul, with that heart, with hikmah. The next point. Should we continue? Anyone say no? Okay. The next point then. You see that long talk we gave on how you must convey this message in hikmah and you have to be da uh, uh, kind in your da'wah and how that is a foundation in origin of da'wah. Now the next point is not the opposite of the first, this point, but a continuation. Just as da'wah should be lenient, and it should be based on wisdom, sometimes, at times, wisdom entails that one is harsh. So that, at times, one can be harsh in da'wah. You can't deny that. The same story we use to show that da'wah is wisdom, and it should be conveyed in kind, in a best manner. Also, those same stories, and many of them, show that there's an aspect in da'wah that's harsh. It's exceptional, yes, but there is a part of da'wah where there is harshness in it. Musa alayhi salam, the story of Musa alayhi salam, when he was ordered to 
go to Fir'aun. We said, فَقُولَ له قولا لينا. Musa at the end, and this a lot of people try to hide it, when Fir'aun got belligerent, when he got arrogant, when Musa sort of hit the end of the channel with him, when he got arrogant with Musa, uh, Fir'aun said to Musa, وَإِنِّي لَأَظُنُّكَ يَا فِرْعَوْنُ مَسْحُورًا Musa, come here. What? He said, I think you're bewitched. وَإِنِّي لَأَظُنُّكَ يَا فِرْعَوْنُ مَسْحُورًا He's mocking him. He's ridiculing him. What did Musa say? فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا Wisdom. But over here, what did he tell him? He said, Musa replied to him and he think, I think you, Fir'aun, this is Musa talking, I think you're doomed, you're cursed. وَإِنِّي لَأَظُنُّكَ you think I'm bewitched? I think you're cursed. I think you're doomed. وَإِنِّي لَأَظُنُّكَ يَا فِرْعَوْنُ مَثْبُورَ مَثْبُورَ You know the word مَثْبُورَ, what it means? مَثْبُورَ means destroyed. It means just doomed. It means cursed. Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنهما said, مَثْبُورَ means cursed. مَلْعُون Ibn مَثْبُورَ means مَلْعُون It's like Musa is telling Fir'aun, you're a mal'oon. وإني, that's what Ibn Abbas's interpretation of the word Mathbura. You're a mal'oon, Fir'aun. And, and uh, other Mufassirin uh, uh, said uh, Mathbura means doomed or destroyed. That means you're going to be doomed or destroyed. So, like Mujahid. Mujahid said Mathbura means doomed. Al Farra said one who has no good in him is what Mathbura is. So, yes, he told him. Be kind to Fir'aun. But there's another side to it that you can't deny. He told him, be kind to, kind to Fir'aun, but there's another side that you cannot deny. Leniency in da'wah is the origin. Leniency in da'wah is the origin. And it's the majority. But don't deny that being harsh, which is usually exceptional, is also part of Islam. Only the deluded modernists and those who go along with them are the ones who deny that being harsh is not part of Islam. It's actually part. Is it exceptional? Most definitely it's exceptional. The overwhelming major majority in the origin and foundation uh, in radix of da'wah is kind and approaching people in the best. But there's also harshness in da'wah. Uh, you have the story of Fir'aun and Musa. You have the story of Namrud and Ibrahim alayhi salam. You have the story of the man in the two Jannah and uh, his brother. You have the story of Qarun and his people. Many stories in the Quran and many stories in the Hadith. Sometimes in these stories, it's lenient. All of it is lenient. Some of it is harsh. Some of it is lenient and harsh. Just like the story of Fir'aun. Yes, they went to him in the West Way initially. But at the end, he told them, وَإِنِّي لَأَظُنُّكَ يَا فِرْعَوْنُ مَثْبُورًا Why? Because we said the definition of wisdom in da'wah, we didn't say it means leniency in da'wah. We said that's the origin of it. Wisdom in da'wah is not leniency. That's the origin of it. Yes, that's the majority of it, but that's not the definition. Wisdom is to put something in its proper place, in the proper manner. In the proper timing. Anyone who does not believe in shahada is kafir. If you don't believe in ashadu an la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you kafir. A kafir is a kafir. I don't, I'm not, I don't know what the problem is with that. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, for, for decades I couldn't uh, you know, uh, understand what the problem is. You don't believe in ashadu an la They call us kafir. If you don't believe Jesus is the son of, of God, you, to them, they consider you a non-believer, a kafir. It means he's not a believer. What's the problem if we say someone is a kafir? I, I, I'm not sure what, what the problem is. We have a kafir and a Muslim. Unlike what the deluded deceivers of this ummah today have been conveying. Allah in the Quran said, هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ فَمِنْكُمْ كَافِرْ وَمِنْكُمْ مُؤْمِنْ خَلَقَكُمْ Creation. مِنْكُمْ كَافِرْ وَمِنْكُمْ مُؤْمِنْ There's only two categories. There's no third category. There's no third category. And when anyone tells you there's a third category, know that he's either ignorant or he's corrupted in his aqidah, and most likely the second. Yes, a non-believer is a kafir. But you don't go to a non-Muslim 
or a Jew, and you tell them you're a non even though non-believer, nothing's wrong with that. You, you don't believe in Islam. You say you're not a believer. You're not a believer. You're a kafir. You're a kafir. You don't do that. That's not the proper method of da'wah. Or you say, hey, come here, you kafir. I want to teach you Islam. That's not the proper way of da'wah. Yes, he is a kafir, but that's not the proper way of conveying da'wah. Even though you don't bargain. He is a kafir. You have to believe that. He is a kafir. But when you convey the da'wah, you don't tell him that you're a kafir. There's no reason for that to tell him that. Sometimes, even people of innovation who are susceptible of learning and possibly coming back to the path, you should be lenient with them. There are many who are bold and arrogant in their innovation and they spread it. They're arrogant about it. They're, when they're at that level, and they want to unleash their tongues. A lot of them like to unleash their tongues on the slaves of Allah and the righteous and pious people of our time in previous times uh, to make the enemies of Allah happy. It may be appropriate at times to be harsh with them because matters like this need to be studied on a case-by-case -case situation. So yes, harshness could be to a bit more person of Mubtada uh, who is an innovator. But it depends if he wants to learn or he accepts the ayat and the Quran and the hadith of the Salaf and the saying of the Salaf, then why would you be harsh to him? So it's the origin. Each scenario needs to be studied and diagnosed by a da'iyah and lectures can be given on the details of when to be harsh and when to be lenient. But you have to understand that there's both in Islam, the overwhelming, the point of this purpose of this is to give an outline. This is just an outline. The point for our purposes here is yes, being kind in da'wah is the origin. And it's the general rule. And it's the majority. But don't ever deny that being harsh in ordaining the good and forbidding the evil may be an exceptional way to do da'wah and convey uh, the right message to someone. Just like the story of Fir'aun. People also usually use the story of Nuh they, to establish leniency in da'wah, which is true. That he, they're going to tell you he made da'wah for 950 years. He lived for more than 950 years, they're going to say. And 950 years he went and gave da'wah, gave da'wah, gave da'wah. And we should be lenient like that and like uh, Nuh alayhi salam. And we got to give da'wah. Yes, he did do da'wah. And that's the majority, like we always say. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَلَبِثَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا خَمْسِينَ عَامًا uh, Nuh was sent to his people and he stayed with them. How long? Alfa سنة, thousand years, short of uh, 50 years, which makes it 950 years. Yeah, but like the story of Fir'aun, there's also another detail to it. In his da'wah, he was very kind. وَيَا قَوْمِ He's telling his people in a kind way. I don't want nothing in return. Allah is going to give me my reward. And I'm not going to oust the people who are believers. Because they're going to meet their Lord. And I see, look at that. He stayed in da'wah. Look at the last point of the verse over here. He stayed in Dawah 950 years, but also, don't forget the other aspect. When they pressed him to drive away the believers, when they kept pushing him to drive away the believers, he called them a bunch of ignorance. I'm not going to drive away those believers. Surely, they are gonna, they're going to meet their Lord, but I see that you people are ignorant. He called them a bunch of ignorant people. He called his people a bunch of ignorance, which is a very harsh word. It's a tough word. وَلَكِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ قَوْمًا تَجَلُونَ And that's, that's in Surah Al-Ahqaf. So yes, in Fir'aun, he was lenient, but he said, Mathbura. Yes, Nuh did 950 years, and he was very kind and gentle in his da'wah, but also, he called them, at one point, وَلَكِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ قَوْمًا تَجَلُونَ He calls them ignorant people. Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he was very lenient to his tribe, and his dad, and he would tell his dad, Ya Abati, يا أبتي يا أبتي لا تعبد الشيطان يا أبتي إني أخافه يا أبتي يا أبتي is a word denoting very kind way very sweet way 
to refer to your dad. It's, it's a sympathetic way of referring to your dad. It's a humble and a respectful way of referring to your dad. Yes, he did that with his dad. But it got to a point. At one point in his da'wah, what did he say? In Surah Al-Anbiya, the same man, Hussein Ya Abatin, was kind and tried to convey the message. He made da'wah in the kindest and best of all manners for years and years. But it got to a point where he said, what did Ibrahim salam say? He said to his people, Uffin lakum. Uffin lakum. Wali ma ta'buduna min dunillah. Uff. Uffin lakum. Uff comes in two qira'at. It comes in two qira'at. The first is Uffa. Uffa. With a fatha and the fa. A fatha and the fa. That's one qira'a. It comes in another qira'a, the one we know. بالكسر والتنوين أفن أفن the meaning of it in both قراءات is الكراهية والاحتقار it means dislike and scorn so he's أفن لكم أف I hate this لكم I hate you in احتقار I look and I scorn you after all those years yes there was a portion of his دعوة where he was harsh he said fie upon you it's translated in the English translation as fi. But often is karahiya and ihtiqar. Disliking and scorning. What is he disliking? Them and that what they worship. Uffin lakum. Fi upon you and upon that which you worship. You have no sense. Afala ta'qilun. Don't you have no sense? Isn't that a harsh way of da'wah? Yes, it is harsh. That was part of da'wah. That was harsh. In Musnad Ahmad, and the portions are in the two sahah when Subay'ah bint al-Harith was widowed. She gave birth shortly after her husband was widowed. She gave birth to a baby boy right after her husband died. Possibly weeks later. Islamic fiqh point of view, she's done with her idda. She can go and get married. She's done with her idda. She does not have to wait the four months, four months and ten days that a woman who was not pregnant has to wait. Abu Sanabil passed by her one time. And he knew or she told him that she just gave birth and she was preparing herself to, to greet and welcome people who are going to be asking for her hand. So he, Abu Sanabil, told her, you got to wait the full four months and ten days. She thought that, was, that didn't seem right. She thought when a woman is, which she was right, when a woman is pregnant and her husband dies, then when she gives birth, that's it. She's done with her idda. He said, no, you have to wait for four months and ten days. It may be, according to some uh, interpretation, he desired to marry her. And she, was reje he, she rejected him. So he wanted to sort of give her a hard time and tell her, you got to wait the longer period, the four months and ten days. She went to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu What did the Prophet sallallahu say? This was the man who taught a Bedouin who was urinating in the masjid. This was a man who told a man who's trying to commit adultery, come here and you rub down his chest. You know what he said? Kathaba Abu Sanabil. Kathaba. In another narration, Laysa kama qala Abu Sanabil. قَدْ حَلَلْتِ فَتَزَوَّجِي He told her, you're free. Your idda's over, you can get married. The Prophet who taught the Bedouin, who was urinating in a masjid, and brought him close and taught him, is now telling, in a most kind way, is now telling about someone, he's a liar. Why? Because the Prophet deemed it appropriate now that it be harsh on this person, this individual. In Muslim, Abu Dawood, in Nasa'i, a man got up to give some speech or give a talk. And he said, Man wa rasulahu faqad rashad. You know, the one we say in the beginning of our Allah khutbah. Man wa rasulahu faqad rashad. Wa man ya'sihima faqad gawa. What do we say? Wa man ya'sillaha wa rasulahu faqad gawa. Instead of saying, Wa man ya'sillaha wa rasulahu, he said, Wa man ya'sihima. Whoever disobeys them, he combined them. He said, Whoever disobeys them, Meaning Allah and his messenger is doomed. The Prophet ﷺ responded to him, he said, Anta. 
بئس الخطيب أنت قل ومن يعص الله ورسوله The Prophet said you're a doomed خطيب you're a doomed خطيب say whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger not whoever disobeys them look at the small difference he said you're a doomed خطيب say whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger you shouldn't be saying whoever disobeys Allah whoever disobeys them you don't say them you say Allah and it's a small mistake the Prophet وسلم, in that simple mistake seen it was wisdom to be harsh with the man who said that for some reason it would in another narration the Prophet وسلم, said come go go get out idhab, idhab, get up and go and in another narration the one I mentioned he said anta. that's very to say a public speaker anta. that could traumatize someone and never give a public speak ever speech after, after that a miserable khatib. Bi'sa means you're a miserable khatib. The Prophet وسلم, deemed in that scenario that this man needed this type of approach. In hadith, uh, in narrated Muslim, Umara ibn Ru'ayba, the one I mentioned when uh, you don't raise your hand during the khutbah as a khatib or a follower during Jum'ah, you don't raise your hands. Umara ibn Ru'ayba seen one of the leaders of Bani Umayyah raising his hands on the pulpit. What did that Umara say? He said, may Allah disgrace those two hands. May Allah disgrace those two hands. I seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam on the pulpit and he never did more than this. Meaning, use his finger. The Prophet used to make dua on the pulpit using his finger. What the point of it is? He said, Umar said, may Allah disgrace those two hands. He deemed it appropriate that he was harsh in that, in that uh, circumstance right there. Abu Ayyub. Abu Ayyub went to Salim ibn Abdullah ibn Umar's wedding. Salim ibn Abdullah ibn Umar is the grandson of Umar ibn Khattab. He went to his house and the wedding. He is the grandson of Umar ibn Khattab, the son of uh, Abdullah ibn Umar. He's seen the walls in Salim's house were covered with drapes, fully covered with drapes. Abu Ayyub radiallahu an said to Salim, the son of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhum ajma'in, he said to him, the Prophet deterred or disliked walls that, to be covered uh, and your walls are covered. Your walls are covered, and the Prophet ﷺ deterred from that. Salim replied to him, he said, you know, our women, our women, you know these days, they overpowered us. Uh, and, you know, he began to justify it, that his women wanted that, and they're stronger, you know, like many do today. Abu Ayyub refused to sit and left the wedding. He left it, you know, wedding, like we said, many of the ulama consider it uh, wajib to respond to it. He left it over drapes all over the walls of Salim. That is a little bit harsh in correcting a mistake. He walking out from the wedding and Abu Ayyub is a companion and a well-known figure of the, uh, of the friends and in, uh, in, uh, Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ibn Umar when he goes on a janazah and the sunnah in janazah is to speed walk. When your janazah is on your shoulders, you do a ramil. The speed walking in Arabi is called a ramil. Uh, uh, Ibn Umar uh, told the people, walk, speed walk. He's on our shoulder, we have to speed walk. If you don't speed walk and do a ramil, I'm going to leave and go back. That's big words. I'm going to leave and depart you and go back and leave this funeral. Uh, why? For mere fact, he deemed it that this was appropriate way with dealing in this circumstance at this time. In the summary of this last two points that I mentioned, let me repeat it. The last two points that I just mentioned. The origin of da'wah and ordaining the good and forbidding the evil is to be lenient. As lenient as, lenient as you can be. We mentioned the verses. We mentioned the story. Don't ever deny though or cancel that there is the approach of being harsh in Islam as the modernists do and others like them. When each method is used, uh, 
It depends on a case-by-case -case circumstance. And really, you can go about for many lectures talking about when to be harsh and when to be lenient and the types of people to be harsh with and the types of people to, to people to be lenient. But the origin and overwhelming majority is leniency in da'wah. The next point. I may have mentioned it, but let me repeat it because it's important. There's a difference in being kind and gentle in da'wah, which is called mudara, is to sacrifice your dunya for your deen. You might be humiliated, you let it go. Uh, you speak and choose the best of all words. You try hardest to choose the best, ahsan. Ahsan means the better, the best. You lower your wing. Sometimes you gotta fight yourself to lower your wing. Uh, you may need to tolerate attacks and convey it and combat it with nice words. You may need to speak nice. You may need to speak nice when you feel like you really don't want to. That happens a lot. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, many ways where you do mudara. That is called mudara. Then there is something that we don't do, which is mudahana. The second one is mudahana. Mudahana is totally different. That is to sacrifice your deen for this dunya. Compromising. We don't compromise. The first one is mudara, sacrificing your dunya for your deen. Mudara. The second one is mudahana, sacrificing your deen for your dunya. We don't do that. We don't deny matters of Islam. We don't please the person we're speaking to by denying or giving an a, a, a incorrect form of Islam. We don't manipulate aspects of Islam to please governments or leaders or Western world. We don't do that. That's mudahana. Uh, Allah said in the Quran, We do mudara, we don't do mudahana. And a da'ya resembles water, water in a vase, in how his da'wah is conveyed, in how he conveys his message. If you put water in a cup, it takes the shape of the cup. The water takes the shape of a cup. If it's in a vase, if it's in a vase, you put water in a cup. It takes the shape of that cup. If it's in a vase, it takes the shape of the vase, whatever, whatever uh, instrument you put water in, it takes that shape. The cup and the vase are solid. The cup is solid. And that's the principles of our deen. We don't bargain. They don't change. They don't change at all. But the water and how it changes in the vase, the shape of it changes, that's how we relate and convey the message. And that's how we deal with people in kind and the best of all manners. The final point is, look at the righteous in their da'wah. Abu Bakr goes days into Islam, days into Islam. He comes back with five of the 10 people granted places in Jannah. Uthman ibn Affan, Zubair ibn al-Awam, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and Talha ibn Ubaidillah. Five within days of the Islam of Abu Bakr. What knowledge at that point did Abu Bakr have? What knowledge at that point did Abu Bakr have of one reward for one to convey Islam? Abu Bakr at that point knew La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So he went with that. What reward was there for one who brings others into Islam? Islam was days old. He goes and brings five of people who were later five of the ten people who were granted places in heaven. There was possibly, most likely, no hadith at that point detailing the reward and bringing others to Islam as we have today. Like the one we mentioned about Ali ibn Abi Talib and like what Prophet Sallallahu life and the Sahaba's life in Da'wah. Something Abu Bakr understood that Islam was his life and goal. When Islam is your life and goal, you speak about it, you convey it. 
You bring others to it. That's common sense. And that's what motivated Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an to bring others into this righteous religion. Do you see one of the reasons why the Iman of Abu Bakr is more than the Iman of the Ummah? Because Abu Bakr had the upper hand in getting your forefathers, the forefathers of Islam, to embrace Islam. Abu Bakr. The Prophet ﷺ brought Abu Bakr to Islam. Abu Bakr brought some of the biggest forefathers of Islam to embrace Islam. That's in addition, of course, to his blind support and belief in the message of the Prophet Muhammad So the Prophet, he got this high honor and ranking of his iman being so much and his deeds being so much. He brought Uthman to Islam. He, got, he brought and showed him the way to Islam. Uthman later became the fourth Khalifa, uh, the third Khalifa. Uthman did so much that we can talk about for weeks and weeks to come. Who gets all the reward? Uthman gets it. And then, because Abu Bakr brought him to Islam, Abu Bakr gets it as well. Abdurrahman ibn Auf, in his achievements, you all know the achievements of Abdurrahman ibn Auf, and they're numerous. Sa'd, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, the man who took Islam from Medina all the way down to Iraq, all the way down to Persia. Today, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas rests in his grave with the reward of billions and billions and billions of Muslims in the regions he opened for Islam. And guess who gets the reward? He gets the reward, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Wa, uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. And likewise, Abu Bakr gets the reward not a tiny less bit than that. The hadith we mentioned. We have to apply the hadith we mentioned. Whoever points someone to righteousness, he gets the reward of that. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas gets the right reward of everyone from Medina down to Persia to Iraq. And so does Abu Bakr. That's just, that's just five of the ten people that he brought to, five people who were granted places in heaven. He brought Bilal. And you know, imagine the reward of Bilal and the, the, the sacrifices Bilal did and the achievements he did. Bilal gets some and Abu Bakr gets some. Now Abu Bakr is in his grave and he gets the reward. At-Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi. The long story of how they were warned. Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi. Al-Dawsi. At-Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi was a leader of his tribe. So Quraysh warned him so much not to follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Because they knew if he followed the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa his tribe is going to follow him. And they had dealings with him that they didn't want to breach or to affect their dealing with him. So he ended up, after a long story, we don't have time to get into, he embraced Islam. Did he recline back? Did he kick back and say, I embrace Islam, I'm a leader of a tribe, and that's it? It's, it's, this is in the early days of Islam. It's, it's obvious, it's common sense, that if you truly have a belief in something, you go and convey it. He goes on to his father as soon as he goes back to his tribe. He tells him Islam. His father tells him, Dini, Dinak. My religion is your religion. Then he goes to his family members. One by one. And they embrace Islam. And among those who embrace Islam is Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira is from his tribe. At-Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi. Among those who he got to embrace Islam is Abu Huraira. Our man of hadith. Our man of many achievements. So everything, every time you read a hadith, and how many times do we say radiallahu an? Every time you read a hadith by Abu Huraira and you make dua for him, the same goes to At-Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi. Daus is his tribe. They gave At-Tufayl, their leader, a hard time. And uh, 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 they gave him a hard time uh, in, in embracing Islam. So At-Tufayl went back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, O Prophet of Allah, make dua on my tribe, Daus. I want you to make dua on them. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wise, kind, da'ya, rahmah lil alameen, he said, Allahumma mahdi dawsan. Allahumma mahdi dawsan. Allahumma mahdi dawsan. And he said, go back to your people and convey. So he went back to his people and he conveyed. He went back and he began da'wah. Now so suddenly, they're accepting the da'wah. So our, he comes back to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa with approximately 80 or 90 clans from his tribe. They all go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa take their shahada and give commitment. And he stays with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
until the final years when Mecca is conquered. Those, what I want to tell you is, those today is where uh, the south of uh, Saudi is. If you look on a map, the south of Saudi is, uh, uh, that's where it is. You know the accident that I mentioned about the, uh, the, the female bride uh, who died with her family members. May Allah have mercy on her and her family and grant those who are living of them patience. That's the area at Tufail ibn Amr al-Dawsi was in. It's, it's, it, the tribes there today mostly are known as Zahran and next to it is the, the tribes of Ghamid. Today there's hundreds of ulama from the tribes of Zahran and Ghamid. Amongst them is the one you all know, Al-Ghamidi, the one you listen to. He's right in the town right next door where At-Tufail was. At-Tufail now is, is his grave uh, 30 centuries later approximately or so. He gets reward in his grave for that famous reciter and there's hundreds of ulama from Ghamid and Zahran or that area where Ad-Dawus is. He gets it, At-Tufail ibn Amr Ad-Dawus, he's in his grave getting that reward and who in, in return also gets it, get, get, gets it. The Prophet of course, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So look at the chain reaction. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes to a barber, he gives da'wah. What comes out of it? In a barber, six teenagers at the barber Embrace Islam. The next year, these six go back, these teenagers, and bring 12. The following year, the 12 bring 73 men and two women. The following year, Mus'ab ibn Umayr is sent as an ambassador to Medina to teach him Islam. Then right after that, Mus'ab ibn Umayr sends a message to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the whole of Medina has embraced Islam. You're welcome to come over here. Six men in a barber shop started this whole thing. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam conveyed message even in a barber shop. And what came out of that is Islam at the end, Islam in Medina. Those teenagers understood that we have to convey this message. They, they, a few moments they sat with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in secrecy and hiding. They took the message and they went on and they knew under conviction that we got to convey this message. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the da'wah of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib in Abyssinia in Africa. The, uh, he placed the seeds of Islam in Africa. In nearly everyone in Africa who is Muslim, most likely Ja'far ibn Abi Talib gets the reward of it today. Because he's the one who went there and conveyed the da'wah and gave the message to al-Najashi. And that's how Islam began to spread in that area. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, Mu'adh ibn Jabal in Yemen. Nearly all these men that we talk about Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, and all those. They was, these were men who were in their early prime, their 20s. They were mu the Mu'min of Yasin. You all know the story of Surah Yasin. Mu'min Yasin. Nearly, nearly 16 or so verses in the Quran talk about this. Who is this man? Who is this man that Allah documents a story in 16 verses mentioning what happened in his situation? Two messengers were sent to uh, people. And then they were followed by another. They threatened their messengers. They threatened that they're going to stone them. They threatened that they're going to torment them. <coughs> and they said the evil omen that they have is because of their messenger. They attributed that to their messenger. A man didn't kick back and relax. That's the mu'min of Yasin. Mu'min al Yasin. The man didn't kick back and relax and say, it's not my business. They got messengers. That's not my business. A man that is known to be righteous comes the, from the furthest part of town. He hears about what's going on. He comes from the furthest part of town. وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى The Aqsa, Aqsa is the furthest part of town. He comes running. He comes from, from Aqsa al-Madina. He comes running. They kill him. He killed him. His heart is attached to da'wah even in the life after. His heart is attached to rescuing people. And he tells, when, when he's granted places in heaven, قِيلَ دْخُلِ الْجَنَّةِ They tell him, you're granted to go to heaven. قِيلَ دْخُلِ الْجَنَّةِ Allah tells him, قِيلَ دْخُلِ الْجَنَّةِ قَالَ يَا لَيْتَ قَوْمِ يَعْلَمُونَ بِمَا غَفَرَ لِي رَبِّي وَجَعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُكْرَمِينَ يَا لَيْتَ قَوْمِ يَعْلَمُونَ بِمَا غَفَرَ لِي رَبِّهِ وَجَعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُكْرَمِينَ Enter paradise. 
He said, I wish my people knew. Even in the life after, his mind is still with his people, trying to get them to be rescued. You see how da'wah is? When it becomes part of someone, he said, I wish I can tell my people how Allah forgave me and made me among those who are honored. So possibly, of course, they can follow in their footsteps and get the honor that I have. I wish I could go back. I wish I can go back. I wish I can make da'wah to them and let them know. He's told to enter heaven and his mind is back there trying to convey this message to his people. قَالَ يَا لَيْتَ قَوْمِي يَعْلَمُونَ بِمَا غَفَرَ لِي رَبِّي وَجَعَلَنِي مِنَ الْمُكْرَمِينَ If examples of messengers, if examples that we're supposed to follow, Sahaba and humans are not enough to inspire you for da'wah, then take the examples of jinn. Even jinn have da'wah and are strong in their da'wah. Look what Allah says about them in, in, in the Quran. The jinn. Ya qawmana. Ajibu. When a group of them embraced Islam and followed the Prophet sallallahu did they just sit back silent? Ya qawmana. Ajibu da'i Allah. Ya qawmana. Ajibu da'i Allah. Wa aminu bihi. Yaghfir lakum min dhunubikum. Wa yujirkum min athabin alim. The jinn were moved to convey this message as soon as they believed in it. As soon as they believed in the message, they wanted to convey it. And this was the jinn. Our people respond. That's what the jinn said. Respond to the call of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Respond to the call of the messenger of Allah by believing in him. Ya qawmana ajibu da'i Allah wa aminu bih. And then they go on to say, you, you believe in him, Allah will forgive you and grant you this and that. So ba basic point is, the jinn themselves wanted to convey the da'wah. If all the messengers, sahab, now the jinn, is not enough to inspire you to do da'wah, then even the animals. Even the animals have da'wah. The story of the hudhud, the hupu in the Qur'an. When Sulaiman had a military march and ordered all his soldiers to be at the march, he noticed a bird was missing. A bird goes from Yemen to Palestine, from, from, uh, from Yemen to Palestine, or, or from Palestine actually to Yemen, and then back. Ordains the good and forbids the evil. He's late to the march. It's organized by Sulaiman. So Sulaiman said, I'm going to punish him by torment or slaughter. He soon after comes back. Where was he doing? He was doing da'wah. He comes back late. He says, I got some news for you. He was on a da'wah mission. He says, hold up. Hold up, Sulaiman. I grasp that which you don't know about. I grasp knowledge you don't know about. I've been forbidden the good, the forbidden Forbidding the evil and ordaining the good. What is it? What do you have? Inni ahattu bima lam tuhit bihi wa jittuka min sabain binabain yaqeen inni wajattu mraatan tamlikuhum wa utiyat min kulli shayin wa laha arshun azim wajattuha wa qawmaha yasjuduna lishamsi min dunillah. I found a woman ruling over some people. She'd been given all things. All things that one could be given. And... Uh, she possessed that which no other ruler has possessed. And she has a great throne. Then people were worshipping the sun. Her and her people were prostrating and believing and worshipping the sun. It can't be silent. A bird. A bird says, I can't be silent. I see them doing shirk. I can't be silent. They need to be worshipping the Lord. The supreme Lord, the Lord of the supreme throne, Allah. In conclusion, in conclusion, after you hear all that, there is a difference between a real flower that gives us a scent and a plastic flower that looks good, a plastic flower that looks good, but only carries the name flower. There's a difference between the two. The real flower, you put it in your house, it has a nice scent, it looks better. But you also got a plastic flower, it looks very good, but there's a huge difference between the plastic and the real flower. 
the Muslim with no da'wah, the Muslim with no da'wah, the Muslim who doesn't ordain the good and forbid the evil, it's like that plastic flower. Looks good. He's still Muslim. We're not saying he's not Muslim. Looks good too because a Muslim is always good inshallah. However, he's like that plastic flower. The one who ordains the good and forbid the evil, forbids the evil and does da'wah, like those we mentioned, the task of the messenger, the tasks of the sahaba, the tasks of the jinn, and even the tasks of some of the animals. The, the one who does da'wah is like a real flower that has a scent. And it's more delightful to look at and it's more preferred to have in your house than, house than a plastic flower. A believer who engages in da'wah, who takes that task upon him, is like a running water. There's a difference. Running water is more pure than still water. If you know about water, running water is always more pure than still water. If water is still, if it's in a pond or in a pool, over time, what happens? You got to look at the matter over time. Over time, what happens? The, it may stay clean for a while in your pool or your pond or uh, any type of still water, even if it's big. For some time, it's going to remain clean. But after a while, a while, it gets tainted. Unlike running water that runs into the oceans and it, 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 it's more pure and, and, clean, and, and, and more clean. Not ordaining the good or doing da'wah. If you don't ordain the good and you don't do da'wah, you're like the still water. You might get tainted after a while. There is no neutral grounds in da'wah. No neutral down, especially for us in the West. There's no neutral ground. You're either giving da'wah, that's how it is. Take that as a rule. There's no neutral grounds in da'wah zone. You can't say I'm just neutral to myself. You're either giving da'wah or you're getting invaded in your belief. The water gets tainted over time, especially in the circumstance that we are in. Be like that clean, running water with a da'iyah, with da'wah to Allah. That clean, running water. A believer doesn't want to be still with his religion. He always wants to move and convey and teach others because that is among the noble tasks, the tasks of the messengers. With this we'll conclude. There's a little bit more I wanted to talk about, but I think this is sufficient for this matter. Uh, Da'wah to Allah. Next week, inshallah, we will go to the fourth aspect. And that will be the final aspect of the four introductory aspects. We can take, I, I know we stayed long, but we can take questions. I don't mind staying if you, anyone wants to stay until we answer the last questions. So go ahead.